So, okay, let's talk about the presidential primary because you mentioned this, this parallel oh. primary. You made the, the observation that Ron DeSantis, yeah. his strategy was to try to blur that lines between the pre and the post Trump party. Yeah. Um, and he ended up alienating both groups. I mean, DeSantis had a theory of the case that just was a complete flop. Yeah, look, um, I think like Kevin McCarthy, Ron DeSantis tried to be a hybrid. He he tried to obey, avoid making the choice. He said, I don't have to decide, and you, Republican voters, you don't have to decide either. You don't have to say which, which camp you're in, post-Trump or pre-Trump. Uh, I'm going to give you both if you want them. Uh, you know, it's like the old saw about, you know, you could lose weight and not change what you're, what you're eating and don't have to exercise at all, man. It's like, sounds good to me. It's on you for that day. You know? Um, it's a little harder application. Um, uh, I'm talking about Rob the Santa's not yeah, yeah. dieting. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but what? Because when you run around bashing the establishment and, you know, equivocating on Ukraine aid, floating, you know, RFK Jr. to be in your administration, uh, trying to outbid Trump on the border, uh, outbid Trump on every kind of uh, culture right. issue. Yeah, it turns out like the pre-Trump establishment that's up for grabs doesn't like that stuff. And then when you try to vie to be Trump's successor and Trump is in the race, well, that's going to irritate Trump's people, right? So I, I just, I don't understand then this belief that um, they you can sort of be all things to all people uh, in this moment where there's such an obvious bright line. Um, but we saw this early, Charlie. I mean, he, he, you know, from early on, he tried to run to the right and it was like the, yeah. the Ted Cruz 2016 campaign. Yeah. Um, there's just not enough votes yeah, really. out there. What? It's not an easy task. To, to be fair to Rod to see this, if you are trying to beat Donald Trump, you have to put together a coalition of uh, folks that listen to your podcast, the kind of never Trumper types, the the folks that were fine with Trump but just kind of want to move on, right? Um, and then kind of like the pre-Trump party establishment, kind of the Wall Street Journal editorial yeah. page. Uh, and that's not easy to forge that coalition, yeah. right? It's not easy. And especially now when you got you know other candidates in the race. But boy, he didn't make it easy on himself. No, he. I mean, first of all, he was a bad candidate. I mean, you know, that's he. He he was not able to scale up from being governor uh, to a presidential race, and you know, being from Wisconsin, that was a I've, seen, I've I've seen Thank Scott Walker do that as as well. Yeah. Um. I yeah. mean, you know, he he's you know doesn't just play an asshole on television. Apparently, he he is one. But I also think that at the heart of all of this was this magical thinking that somehow. Um, something, something, something would happen. The unicorn would come along and Donald Trump would disappear. I think that they thought um, mm -hmm. that with all of these indictments that Republicans would surely turn to somebody else, that they would mm -hmm. want, you know, the Trumpism without Trump baggage. And they, I think, are as shocked as anyone that Donald yes. Trump became stronger with every indictment. Is there any scenario in your mind in which Donald Trump at this point does not get the Republican nomination? I think it's less likely Um at this stage, given that we, you know we are fast approaching November here, and obviously it's formidable, I still think it's possible. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to be the team coming out of the locker room in the second half, Charlie, facing this deficit. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, I think it's it's still possible. But look, it would take significant and rapid coalescence behind right. an alternative here that we have not seen, and it would take you know, de defeating Trump early. You got to get him in Iowa or New Hampshire. There's just, there's no way that this this is a traditional race where, oh, we'll win over the field in Iowa and then New Hampshire and then we'll, we'll battle yeah. down South Carolina on Super no, Tuesday. It's, it's, uh -oh. it's going to be over like that. It's, yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's got to happen sooner than that. They got to get behind one key. And I tell you, I'm really interested. I think the next couple of months are going to be fascinating because, look, the, the amount of pressure, especially from the money crowd that is just, you know, petrified about Trump as the nominee again, that I think it's going to sort of come to bear trying to win all this field. Okay, so who 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 drops out? I mean, Tim Scott seems like he's dead man walking. Mike Pence can't get 15 people to show up at, you know, a pizza yes. hut or whatever that that was. It's where, a ranch. Come on, man. It's Iowa here. But, but, but um, in order, I mean, this, this is this is giving me the, the, the 2016 vibes where it, it, it appears at least on started. paper, yeah, on yeah. paper that 
that the 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 one person who might be able to go one on one would be Nikki Haley. But what's happening right yep. now? Not Ron DeSantis is attacking Nikki Haley. So yeah, that's well, very 2016. Of 20, I was going to say, speaking of 2016 vibes, yeah, we, we certainly saw that movie with uh, with Jeb uh, Jeb Bush, yeah. Marco Rubio. Um, no, it's so true. Um, you know, these candidates can't help themselves, and when they see one emerging as the alternative, they try to knock down uh, that candidate instead of focusing on the person that they're trying to be the alternative to. Um, and of course, that, that is what Trump loves. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, I think it's pretty clear at this stage that the alternative that if there is one would be to see this or, or Nikki Haley. And I, this next debate in November will go some ways to clarifying that. Uh, I think if Nikki Haley does yeah. well in that debate, I think you'll see a ton of money move her way. And I think you'll see pressure on all the other candidates in the race to drop. Does the money make any difference anymore, though? I mean, this is a serious question. I mean, because given given the nature of our politics and the communications, the way in which, you know, information spreads and the way the base is broken down. So l- let's say that that all of the rich, rich, non-crazy, okay, $100 million I give her. What, what happens? What does she do with it? Okay. I think the answer to your question, the way you're phrasing it, no, it doesn't matter that much. I yeah, think okay. it matters in the sense of sending a message as to who the Trump alternative is, right? It's a cue. Oh, it's okay. endorsements, it's it's money, and it's folks dropping out and you know taking taking those those um, cues. And um I think that's that's where it matters, right? It's sort of picking up the money crowd, picking up endorsements, um uh, you know, having good debate performances. I think that's the stuff. Okay, uh, that, that makes that I, I can see. Okay, let, let's let's you and I engage in a little bit of magical yeah. thinking because we remember yes. what happened with the Democrats back in 2020, where it yes. looked like Bernie Sanders might win, and then Absolutely. suddenly the entire field coalesced. In fact, even in retrospect, it is amazing all of the candidates yeah. that dropped out and said, "No, we have to endorse Joe Biden." So, what you're yeah. saying is the money people get together and they say, "Let's." I'm, we're engaging in magical thinking here. Right. Um, we we want it to be um, Haley, and we're, we're we're sending that out. She has a good debate, right. and so right. Mike Pence drops out, endorses yes. Nikki Haley, right? Yes. Um, right. Uh, Tim Scott drops out, endorses Nikki Haley. I'm I'm making that's this up as I go along. No, no, um, exactly. Ron, uh, I tell, Ron, I tell Ron DeSantis or, or Glenn Youngkin says, "I'm not running. I'm supporting Nikki Haley." Does it create a Brian Kemp says, plan? "Look, folks, I beat Trump. I know what it takes to beat Trump. Nikki Haley is the one that can do it." We got to get behind her. This is the moment. Yes, I think that's yeah. what it takes. And I think that your model is exactly right. And I think if, if there was an anti-Trump Republican out there who was looking, maybe even praying uh, for, for some answer here of, of how Trump can be stopped, I think it's unlikely. Uh, but I think that is the way that we see a repeat uh, in some fashion of the yeah. 2020 Democratic primary. That is the precedent. And if, to your point, Charlie, about how politics works today, it is so lightning quick. Joe Biden won the South Carolina primary after being 0 for 3 on a Saturday night in February. Right. All right. Super Tuesday was the following Tuesday, three days later. Right. And in, in, in that 72 hour period, Biden effectively Just wrapped right up there. his party's right. Just like that. Right. Because of those cues that I mentioned earlier, right? The cues that were set. Okay. Uh, Amy Klobuchar drops out. Mayor Pete drops out. Beto yeah. emerges from exile. And they all rally to Biden. Obama makes a few well-placed phone calls. All right. Yeah. And there's this incredible momentum sway to Biden starting at Saturday at about 930 at night that, that winds up leaving Biden the nominee effectively. Yeah, there is some work in Michigan still, but effectively the following Tuesday night. Now, other stuff played a part there. Bernie didn't have a great period after Nevada. Bloomberg right. got crushed by Elizabeth Warren out at the Bay State. The, there were helpful factors. Here, so if you're somebody looking to stop Trump, that's the model for how it acts. There's a fast coalescence. All right. That's the good news for the folks looking to stop Trump. The bad news yeah. is Bernie Sanders ain't Donald Trump. All right? Right. Um, that's where the analogy Donald gets Trump, a little bit, f- f- yeah, gets it uh, does. Donald frayed. Trump is a global phenomenon with an iron yeah. grip on uh, millions of people in this country across every state. Um, Bernie Sanders was not that. And so uh, it's a little different. Um, also, Charlie, 
so many Democratic primary voters in 2020 were one issue voters. And the one issue was who could beat Trump in the fall. That's all they cared about. That's all they and cared look, about. And look, some of those people still exist today. Uh, they're one issue voters. It's who can beat Donald Trump in our primary today. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, what is that? How many people in the primaries, you know? Yeah, we, we, we don't know. Okay, so um, in, the, in the time we have left, you wrote yes. a very, this is, by the way, is the least popular topic among our audience. I just wanted to, to warn you, you know, trigger warning here. You are yes. a really, really strong piece uh, in, in, in Politico about Biden's age. Yes. And the fact that Biden is not directly addressing that age yes. issue. Now, yes. I, I guess I, 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 this was a very strong piece. I was starting to think that, that they had figured out that mm-hmm. if they joked about it, if they sort of you know, kept bringing it up, everything. Mm-hmm. But, but you point out that they've done very little to confront um, the biggest yes. threat to his reelection. They're not yes. polling about it. So yes. talk to me about that. that because I, because I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was shocked by your piece. That not that there had not been more focus on confronting what is the elephant in the room. I think his staff and his advisors know it's a sensitive issue. They don't want to be the ones who go into the office and say, "Hey, boss, uh, the overriding issue about you and what defines you with most American voters is that you're an old man, and well, you have to try to fix that." Like, who wants to be that staff? Right? I mean, yeah. not a lot of hands going up. And um, but it was striking to me to learn that you know, even away from Biden a little bit, that at the research level, there's just not the appetite to, to, to pull it. That may change. You're closer to the campaign. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a pretty cavalier attitude. Every focus group among Everyone. Democrat voters, among swing voters, talk to any pollster in America. Right. When you bring up Biden's name, he's entirely defined by his age. No one knows anything he's done. All they know is that he's an old guy who occasionally has gas or falls. That's just what voters say. It just is. And um, uh, I'm not sure that Biden is willing to confront it. If you put mm. Biden on truth zero, I think he'd probably say, um, you know, they're going to vote. They're going to vote for old versus crazy or, you know, you know, right, old right. versus scribble. Yeah, you know? I'm old, but he's crazy. That I mean, that's about the best formula you can come up with. Right. Yes, I, or, I am old. Or, he's nuts. Or, he's or, dangerous. Or, or, you know, he's in the leg irons and he's going to serve five years in federal prison. I mean, that to put a finer point on it, right? Um, yeah. And if that's the alternative, obviously Biden can make that case. Um, but you got to be willing to make it, right? I, I don't know if Biden's pride will will stop it. Um, there's a, a great old line mm-hmm. I actually used at the end of that piece, but um, I'll mention it here because the political junkies will, will appreciate this. One of the most memorable campaigns uh, at the state level in modern American history when David Duke was the nominee for governor of Louisiana in 1991, he was running against an old cage named Edwin Edwards. Edwin Edwards was not, not burdened by a strong moral compass, Charlie, to put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, there's a you know saying about Louisiana, he said, uh, everybody in Louisiana is either underwater or under indictment. Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, Edwin had been uh, under indictment, he'd he done some time. Um, yeah. But she was the Democratic standard bearer, and she was the only guy standing between the state of Louisiana and a Klansman being their governor, right? And there was this great bumper stick that emerged, and the bumper sticker said, vote for the crook, it's important. And it was a oh. great way to Louisiana voters, because it was saying, yeah, you don't maybe like this guy, but that's the best alternative we got, right? And so can Biden come up with the equivalent of that, Right. Uh, vote for the codger. It's a board, right? I mean, we'll see. Well, I can see Trump doing the same thing. I, I can see him having, you know, the ankle bracelet as the symbol, you know, vote, vote for the, you know, vote for the crook because it's important. And his base will go, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. wow. Um, you know, we we apparently are about to buy this ticket again, and it's going to be one hell of a ride, Jonathan. So, hey. It's remarkable. Enjoy- it's a long ways from, from Scott Walker and Paul Ryan. She's had time in Wisconsin, man. Those were way tell, tell, days. Tell me, tell me about a kinder, gentler era. We didn't <laughs> think so at the time. Hey, enjoy your time in Blighty. And we'll thanks, talk Charlie. when we get back. All right. Thanks a lot. And thank you all for I'll listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.